Sydney is a recent graduate from University of Vermont's Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. For her graduate resource, or graduate research, it's hard to, Sydney combined a paleolimnological study with long-term water chemistry data and present phytoplankton community composition to assess how lakes in Vermont impacted by acid rain deposition are recovering both chemically and biologically. When she's not sampling lakes, she enjoys mountain biking, cooking, and hikes in Colorado's high country, where she is right now. So Dr. Mindy Morales-Williams is an assistant professor at the Rubenstein School. Her research and teaching focus on the role of anthropogenic disturbance and climate change processes in lake carbon cycling and phytoplankton functional diversity, including the formation and maintenance of harmful cyanobacteria blooms. For her doctoral degree at Iowa State University, she investigated feedbacks between cyanobacteria blooms and carbon emissions in eutrophic lakes. As a postdoc researcher at the University of Minnesota, she investigated the impacts of terrestrial biodiversity on downstream aquatic microbial biodiversity and function. So Sydney today uh, is gonna talk about her project that she worked on with Mindy, assessing chemical and biological recovery from acid rain deposition in Montaigne, Vermont lakes. Thanks, Sydney. Yeah, thank you for that great introduction. I'm just trying to, oops. I have my like panel of everyone's images kind of on the side and trying to arrange that, but um, we can do without. So thank you very much for having me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to come back into the, the UVM world and present some research that I had a good time doing. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about my thesis work that I did under the guidance of my advisor, Mindy Morales. And the title, like Juliana says, is Assessing Chemical and Biological Recovery from Acid Rain Deposition in Montaigne, Vermont Lakes. And before we get into the meat and potatoes of my project, there's a handful of individuals and groups that I need to acknowledge because without them, this wouldn't have been possible. And so my advisor um, and then my committee members, in addition to the Rubenstein School, and I was a recipient of the Heiser Graduate War Award, in addition to the USGS Waters Center um, Award as well. And I was fortunate enough to be um, to work with the state of Vermont and kind of, they took me under their wing in terms of sampling and allowed me to work with them on their acid lakes. And um, all the support that I got from my peers at the, the lab um, down the, the lake. And so to orient everybody, um, I've set up my talk, so I'll just sort of walk you through my introduction. Um, so the problem we're talking about here is acid rain deposition and assessing chemical and biological recovery in aquatic systems, and then looking at ecosystem responses and changes in ecology. So my first of two chapters is a multi-proxy paleolinological study assessing recovery from acid rain in a montane pond in Vermont. My second chapter is the assessment of the current relative abundance of potential bloom forming cyanobacteria in four acid impaired lakes. And to broadly conclude, um, we did see evidence of chemical recovery in acid impaired lakes. And we also found phytoplankton community compositions have shifted due to changing ecological conditions. So acid rain deposition and its impact on aquatic environments is an interesting topic um, and lakes are really important because they serve as important resources for recreational and from an environmental standpoint. I'm inherently biased. I think lakes are wonderful. Um, I chose to study them for a handful of years. And in addition to them being really important um, environmental resources, they're really sensitive. And so they reflect changes in the surrounding landscape and atmosphere, and they can act as early warning signals. And so Acid rain is by no means a regional problem. It's studied throughout the Northeast, um, in New York, in the Adirondacks, and also in the Sudbury Lakes region of Ontario. And in Europe, there's a handful of ongoing long-term projects monitoring recovery from acidification. And impacts and disturbance from acid rain have been studied in these parts of the world um, since the 60s and 70s when um, surface or acidified surface waters were first identified. And to get our emissions under control um, as a result of increases of acid rain deposition, the Clean Air Act was established in 1970, and then the amendments were further put into effect. And because of the regulations on emissions, there was an observed decrease in the amount of acid rain forming pollutants in the environment or in the atmosphere that made their way to the environment. 
And so what you see here are three-year averages of total sulfur and nitrogen deposition. Sulfur is on the top, nitrogen is on the bottom, and it's monitoring the past two decades about. And so what's pretty obvious is the substantial decrease of sulfur and nitrogen deposition from the early 2000s to only a few years ago. And that's wonderful because you can see that the Clean Air Act amendments have been working. There's been um, progress in um, the reduction of emissions, but that leaves a lot of questions on how previously acidified systems are responding to these changes. And so here's a map of our study sites. Um, they span the, the, the state of Vermont. And a big part of this project was long-term monitoring of these acid impaired lakes. And so for the past 41 years, there have been 12 lakes that were identified as acid impaired, and those have been monitored by the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's long-term monitoring of acid sensitive lakes program. Um, and these lakes are wonderful because they serve, not only are they beautiful, and I've had the pleasure of going and sampling them, but they're model systems in the sense that they address recovery. Um, and unlike other states in Vermont, they're not impacted by say farm runoff, road salts, or other pollutants. And long-term monitoring is the key to understanding the results that we're getting. Um, this database that I use called Vermont IWIS is an extensive database that collects water chemistry parameters and provides us with um, a resource that um, allows us to find distinct trends um, in these lakes that are recovering from acidification. So my thesis is centrally focused around two questions. The first question being is, as Beaver Pond recovers from acidification, are diatom communities returning to their pre-acidification composition or are they on a new trajectory? The second chapter, and the main question of that is, what is the current relative abundance of potential bloom forming cyanobacteria during the ice free season in Vermont's acid impaired lakes. And so we use long term data to assess chemical recovery from acidification. And different indicators of recovery from acidification are increases in acid neutralizing capacity, pH, and dissolved organic carbon. Increases of dissolved organic carbon are often linked to increased climate change pressures as well. And this change in water color is something we refer to browning. An example of browning is the picture on the right side of your screen that shows three different beakers with a gradient of brown water. Um, the, uh, the left side of the screen shows um, pH increase over time from a long-term study in the Sudbury Lakes region. The black bars indicate pH below five. The white bars indicate pH above six. And as you can see over time, the black bars are shrinking in size and the white are increasing, um, thus indicating recovery from acidification. So all this to say is that lakes are recovering and their ecology is changing rapidly too. And so with that ecology, something we have to talk about is um, lake browning. And so we've noticed concurrent increases in pH and DOC. And there's a couple of mechanisms that drive browning in acid lakes and lakes in general. So climate warming being the first and increased temperatures, um, climate change and causes increased soil microbial respiration. And that increases the export of um, soil organic matter from the terrestrial environment to the aquatic environment. The second is increased um, precipitation. So in recent decades, there's been recorded um, increases of frequency and severity of storm events. And so the increase of precipitation drives um, more soil matter from land to water, thus um, increasing browning. And the third is uh, decreased sulfur deposition. So if you can remember from a few slides ago, there was that map that showed this decline of sulfur, which is great. Um, however, this concept is a touch more complex because sulfate strongly binds with carbon in terrestrial soil. And when that is decreased, soil carbon is more mobile um, and can be exported more easily via the above processes, so climate warming and precip. And so what does all of this mean for our Vermont lakes? And we know that um, biological recovery is slower than chemical recovery in acidified systems. And unfortunately, it's uh, biological recovery of phytoplankton is not as well documented as chemical recovery. And something that makes it more challenging is there's not necessarily one mechanism that controls recovery. So you have to assess current nutrient and chemical statuses and also climate change pressures. And while there's evidence for water uh, quality recovery, like I said, that's not the case necessarily for biological recovery. And so an ideal way to, to assess the two is to compare a 
pre-stress um, biological environment with that of a post-stress biological environment. And so something that is a tool that's really helpful in doing that is a paleoimmunological study. Um, and so that's what we chose to use to assess recovery from acidification. And so that brings us to chapter one. Um, and an exciting, uh, exciting news is this was actually recently accepted in the Journal of Paleoimmunology. So um, we're thrilled about that. So paleoimmunological evidence of chemical and biological recovery from acidification in a Montaigne, Vermont, USA lake. And our research question is, as beaver pond recovers from acidification, are diatom communities returning to their pre-acidification composition, or are they on a new trajectory? And so this is beaver pond, one of our study, or our study site for this project. It's located in the northeast corner um, of the state, and actually the pond itself nearly straddles the Canadian border. What's unique about it is it's geographically extremely remote, and there's no development in the watershed. Um, the site has been um, subject to extensive logging um, in the past century. And it's a pretty decently sized pond. It has a depth of 25 meters. pH is actually the highest of um, the, our study sites. And for this project, it's, or for this specific um, study, it was 6.2. And then moderate DOC and an average summertime temperature of 21.5 degrees Celsius. So there are a lot of moving parts for this project. Um, we started with long-term chemistry trends and analyzed those to see what the relationships were. We then went below the surface and did a handful of geochemical analysis on um, sediment cores. We analyzed diatom community composition and then quantified the shifts of diatom communities to assess recovery. And so what can lake sediments really tell us? And they can tell us a lot. Um, Paleolimnological studies focus on reconstructing past environments. And we can use geologic records to study climate change, eutrophication, um, and acid rain uh, deposition, to, to name a few. And our study uses diatoms and geochemistry measures to understand how this lake was impacted by acid rain and now how it's recovering. Diatoms are a really useful tool because they have um, different threshold and optima. And so certain diatom species thrive better in a low pH environment than those in a high pH environment or something that's circumneutral. Um, they're also sensitive to nutrient concentrations as well and different mixing regimes. So these are long-term water chemistry trends and we use the non-linear approach to identify breakpoints and otherwise linear trends um, and to quantify changes in acid impaired surface waters th throughout our monitoring period or sorry, not our monitoring period, the long-term data we had. And so to orient everybody, um, the blue lines that you see that are dotted um, indicate the breakpoints. And so the dark gray bars across the other data are the averages before and after the breakpoints. The horizontal red bars um, indicate significant breakpoints with 95% confidence intervals. And so to translate what these plots are saying is um, breakpoints in, I'll start with pH. The breakpoints in surface water and hypolimnion pH indicate um, trends of recovery. So as you can see, there's an increase um, in 2008 about in the amplimnion, and then in about 2005 in the hypolimnion. Moving to DOC, there's only one significant breakpoint, and DOC in the epilimnion um, increases following 2001 and began to stabilize in about 2012. And this suggestion of this stabilization um, it might be a suggestion of soil carbon leaching into the watershed. We didn't identify any significant breakpoints in the hypolimnion um, for DOC and nor for any temperature trends either. But all these trends considered, um, it, it, it evident of increases of pH and uh, which indicates recovery. So now we're gonna go below the surface and talk a bit about uh, sediment geochemistry and our carbon to nitrogen ratios. And so these are important, or this is an important ratio because it's an indicator of land use change in lake production that might indicate relative proportions of terrestrial and algal, car or algal carbon um, deposition. And so in Beaver Pond, our carbon to nitrogen ratios were variable, but they showed a distinct upward trend throughout our study period. Um, indicating primary terrestrial and non-algal inputs. These trends are likely influenced by extensive logging, which occurred twice in the region. What we did was separated this plot into three different zones. 
And to orient everybody, this zone one is the oldest sediment or the long that happened the longest um, event that happened the longest time ago. And we know these dates because we had this core uh, led to 10 dated. And so in zone one, there's a general negative trend occurring in percent carbon and carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, and these indicate um, timber harvest in the region, which might have um, caused an increased flux of carbon poor sediments. And the forests surrounding um, Beaver Pond were clear, clear cut um, twice. And so our zone two um, shows a stabilization of percent carbon and a continued decline in carbon to nitrogen ratio. And this zone is where we see peak acidification and a final timber harvest. And this suggests a stabilization of percent carbon might be due to the reduction of organic material during this regrowth time of the, um, of the forest itself. And zone three, which is our most modern snapshot of what's happening is timber harvest is concluded. There's a continued decline in carbon to nitrogen and a slight increase in percent carbon increase in, which indicates an increase of in-lake algal production beginning in around 1970. And percent nitrogen is also of note. Um, it has a very similar, if not identical pattern to percent carbon. And due to the lake's remote location, what we believe is happening is that upcourt, the upcore trends are influenced mostly by atmospheric um, pressures. And so here's a stratigraphic plot of our diatom data. And to orient everybody again, just as the, the previous plot, the oldest dates are on the bottom and the most recent are on the top. And so we have a time frame of about 167 years and we observed the largest shift in community composition between 1950 and 1988. And that's where that red box is. And what you see is an increase in acid tolerant species followed by, or sorry, a, de a decline in acid tolerant species and then a return of those species following the acidification event. And so here's the same plot, but just different um, highlights of different species. And so I encourage you not to necessarily look at the names of the diatoms, but look at the colors of the boxes. So we identified a total of 79 species and plotted the most, the top 20 that were most abundant. And so blue is the most are acid sensitive species, orange are the acid tolerant species, and the green boxes are indicators of recovery. So our acid sensitive species, we noticed a notable decline um, at peak acidification and then a, a suggestion of recovery post acidification. Orange, our acid tolerant species, um, we see an increase in relative abundance of acetophilic taxa at the peak of acid rain deposition. And then our green box species um, are indicators of recovery. And what I mean by that is that these are present pre acidification but don't necessarily appear again post-acidification in large um, relative abundances. Abundant before acidification, decline during, increase after. So that makes us think about new trajectories. So there's one species called Frustrulia rhomboides, which is the third orange box from the right. Um, there have been studies uh, in Norway that have found that this species actually thrives in lower light conditions. And so we're seeing that similar trend here, it was it increasing DOC in um, in Beaver Pond, that this increase of this species, in addition to um, an, an addition, excuse me, in addition to another one called Brachycyra brespinini, also prefer lower light conditions. So, although this lake might not be coming to um, its its pre acidification community, it, it suggests that with different species, it might be on a different trajectory. So as Beaver Pond recovers from acidification, our diatom communities returning to their pre-acidification composition or are they on a new trajectory? And we found that long-term water chemistry data and paleoluminological data suggest Beaver Pond is experiencing recovery from acidification. And alkalinity has increased significantly since 1980, but pH did not begin to increase until about 2003. This indicates improving buffering capacity and ecosystem function. We've also noted shifts in diatom community assemblages are sing signals of recovery, um, but they're not on trajectory to return to the pre-acid rain community composition. So that brings us to chapter two, um, seasonal patterns of phytoplankton biodiversity in montane lakes recovering from acidification. 
Our research question is, what is the current relative abundance of potentially bloom forming cyanobacteria in lakes recovering from acidification? And are they susceptible to harmful algal blooms? So how are fire planting communities responding to recovery from acidification? Like I said earlier, lakes are sensitive systems and some recover at different rates than others. And that recovery can result in their ecology changing and turning more brown and some lakes are becoming more productive. And there's an impact of global changes on oligotrophic lakes, which are otherwise known as low nutrient systems and that these changes have altered their ecology and there have been documented cyanobacteria blooms. I should clarify, not in these study lakes, but just oligotrophic lakes um, in general. And so cyanobacteria are unique because their adaptability increases their survivability. Cyanobacteria have a amazingly long 3.5 billion year evolutionary history. They're an extremely broad group of organisms with a wide range of environmental optima. They have a handful of different competition strategies as well. So cyanobacteria are impressive light harvesters in the sense that they have a range of auxiliary pigments, which expand their ability to capture light um, and that can be used by photosynthesis. And they also have buoyancy controls so they can migrate up and down the water column, which allows them to access nutrients and um, arrive in the euphotic zone where they can be most productive. And they also have a high surface area to volume ratio. So here are Here's the entirety of our study sites. So we have four across the state of Vermont, Beaver Pond, which you're familiar with, and then four or three others in the southern part of the state. And these four sites were selected intentionally because they span an orthogonal gradient of dissolved organic carbon concentrations and pH. And they've been, they're a quarter of the study that the Vermont DC has been conducting for the past four decades. Like Beaver Pond, the other three lakes are geographically isolated and watersheds that are not subject to development nearby. And so understanding the susceptibility of these lakes to the formation of um, cyanobacteria blooms is central to our study. So our methodology uh, for this project as well had a handful of moving parts. We started with the analysis of long-term water chemistry trends, developed regression models to assess relationships between variables. We sampled, um, phytoplankton from our four study sites in the spring, summer, and fall in 2018 and 2019. We then identified and quantified um, phytoplankton and calculated biovolume and Shannon diversity index. We also um, conducted analyses to assess trends of recovery from acidification using an NMDS ordination. So here are long-term changes in water chemistry that point um, in the direction of recovery. And so I'll start on the left side of the screen with pH. And we've, I plotted these um, seasonally because that's how we identified, that's where we looked at our samples was um, in the season that they were collected. And so trends of e in each pond reveal increases of pH over the long-term monitoring period. Since we, and like I said, since we analyzed them seasonally, we wanted to visualize the trends in each season. And um, they all reveal a directionally positive relationship though um, beaver pond, like I said before, um, is not significant. And moving to the other side of the screen, so DOC trends, there are significant increases at all sites in the beginning of the, from the beginning of the monitoring period. And this is important for our analysis um, because with thinking about phytoplankton and dissolved organic carbon, DOC in an aquatic environment is a really important mediator of light attenuation, thermodynamics, and ecosystem metabolism. So these two um, water chemistry variables and how they've changed over time are important for understanding uh, ecology. So here's the meat and potatoes of our study. So we calculated the percent relative abundance of biovolume at our study sites. And in total, we identified 60 taxa between eight broad taxonomic groups. So the different groups that were present or chrysophytes, chlorophytes, diatoms, and dinoflagellates being the most um, abundant. We also found mixotrophic algae um, in our samples and in oligotrophic environments, those are favorable for mixotropes due to their light, um, excuse me, due to their nutrient limitations. Mixotropes are unique because they can utilize um, light and inorganic nutrients as a source of material for growth. And I'm sure you can see a lot of green on these plots and that indicates 
um, chlorophytes. Those are also very dominant in the study. Um, Spirogyra were the dominant chlorophyte that was present, and there are filamentous green algae. So there was a presence of cyanobacteria in our acid lakes, and we deemed these com concentrations as more ambient, and they were present in 88% of our samples, typically at very low levels um, of percent relative abundance between one and 7% of biovolume. And so there were no bloom farming events that we observed. And I wanna draw your attention to the, the big orange box on the bottom of the screen, um, which is Born Pond. And that is our outlier. Um, most of the cyanobacteria that were present there are Delic spermum. And that has also been found in other blooms and oligotrophic lakes in the New England region. And so here we have seasonal changes in biodiversity. And this is our Shannon Weiner um, diversity index. And we wanted to look seasonally at some, some noteworthy trends we found. And so we classify beaver and born ponds, which are on the um, left side of the screen as moderate DOC systems. At both sites, we have observed an increase in diversity, or sorry, excuse me, a decrease of diversity from the summer to the fall. And the observed changes in biodiversity between the seasons coincide with changes in um, seasonal DOC concentrations with a decline from summer to fall. Big Mud Pond on the top right of your screen has the highest, has the highest diversity in both fall seasons. And this might be due to the shifting um, from chlorophyte dominated um, phytoplankton communities to that of an environment with more diatoms. And this is our non-metric multi-dimensional scaling ordination, otherwise known as NMDS. And what we did here was we determined the distance between the broad taxonomic groups in our study sites. And this analysis helped us um, establish a year to year, the differences in the community structure as they relate to environmental conditions. And so to orient everybody, the blue arrows are different environmental vectors. And the longer the arrow, the stronger the correlation is with the environment, with the um, phytoplankton group that you see present. And so, between the two years, we'll start in 2018. As you can see, temperature and chlorophytes trend together closely in cyanobacteria and DOC, in addition to total phosphorus trending with diatoms. In 2019, you see a very strong correlation with pH and cyanobacteria, diatoms and total phosphorus, and then um, cryptophytes, dinoflagellates, and chrysophytes are grouped together, but don't necessarily trend with a specific environmental variable. And so what we noticed about um, the relationship between DOC and cyanobacteria in 2018 and pH and cyanobacteria in 2019 is that as lake ecology continues to shift, conditions might be more favorable um, for that of cyanobacteria. And so just to circle back our research question, what is the real, current relative abundance of potentially bloom forming cyanobacteria in lakes recovering from acidification? And are they susceptible to harmful algal blooms? So we found cyanobacteria at all sites and ambient concentrations. The highest concentrations of cyanobacteria were recorded in ponds which have moderate DOC, so beaver and born. And as pH and DOC continue to increase, shifting environments may be susceptible to the formation of algal blooms. And findings from this study, I would say emphasize the importance of long-term monitoring and provide the groundwork um, to continue study acid impaired lakes. And so to draw some conclusions, Trends indicate that acid lakes in Vermont are recovering from acidification, both chemically and biologically. Um, their biological recovery may be on a new trajectory due to increased climate change pressures. And with results from the study, I emphasize the importance of the continuation of monitoring phytoplankton communities and acid impaired lakes as we seek to further understand the complex dynamics of sensitive alpine systems. And that concludes my portion of this talk, and I'm going to pass the torch to Mindy, who has some updates in, of her projects. Yeah. Here we go. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so now I just want to give you a quick sneak peek of some newer work that's going on in our lab group. Um, this is new master's research by. <laughs> Julian's telling me to speak up, so I'll speak up. Um, 
This is new work being conducted by a master's student in our lab here, Ismo Rivera, um, building off of the work that Sydney did while she was here. And basically, what Ismo is looking at is landscape scale changes in um, diatom community composition across many lakes in Vermont. Um, and so, what he's done here, uh, so I should start by saying these data were um, shared with us from the Vermont DEC. These are all from lake sediment cores that they collected across 103 lakes in the state um, and have uh, diatom communities characterized for those cores. And so Ismar was interested in which of these lakes um, have changed the most in diatom community composition from pre-industrial times to the present. And so the plot you're looking at on the left, <laughs> on the left um, is ranking a subset of those lakes um, from the greatest change, which are the lakes on the top, to the least change in diatom community composition or um, community turnover between uh, the beginning of the core record to the modern part of the core record. Um, and what we found, he then analyzed that with a uh, regression tree analysis to identify um, the most important environmental predictors of diatom community turnover. In these lakes. And we found that alkalinity at a landscape scale, so across all these lakes, was the most important predictor of change in these communities um, from pre industrial era to the present, um, which is really interesting, right? Because Sydney's work was focused on, um, the paleo work was focused on one pond, and the modern work was focused on four ponds. This is um, based on 103 lakes across the state. And so we found that alkalinity was a very important driver, specifically lakes with low alkalinity um, had the greatest changes over this long time period. And then terminal nitrogen, conductivity, pH, as you would expect, which is related to alkalinity, and the last most important variable is the soil phosphorus. Um, so as I said, this is preliminary work. This is also uh, USGS Water Center Award uh, that just started in September, or September 1st. And so um, in progress things that ISMAR has coming up are to further analyze these data um, and identify specific diatom indicators of environmental change correlate this with things like vegetation, um, increased salinity in the lake, 